that's interesting. The camera just turned on. The camera did? Oh, I have to sign into Boise State. I don't know, maybe it like does retinal scans or something. Here. This is really slow. Yeah, it is. And I don't have it on a... I don't have it on a anything that's hooked up with it. Oh, there it goes. Okay. I'm going to have to log in. and It's just really slow. I don't know this keyboard. Uh, I'll be careful so I don't have to redo it. Since I just changed it again. All right. A little by little, you're there. <laughs> Yoga stretches. Stand up. Yeah, exactly. He's gonna make a massage chain. Yes, it's, yes me. it's me. Of course, it's me. I just put it in. Yeah, twice. I don't understand why that happens, but yeah. I know it. Well, it's so worthless. I yeah. Mean. Yes, I recognize it. I mean, did I not just sign into that account? Of course, I recognize it. email, like, you know. Yeah. All right. Docs. I want Google Docs. That's not it. I just worked on it. At least it has a catchy word in the title. I'm is it have a the lot one on my card that shared with you? Or is oh, it, it probably is. But you still should get to it, right? Yeah, because I just worked on it. But There it is. 2.39 p.m. That's the one. All right. Should we cl close the doors? Yeah, I'll go do that. Well, congratulations, congratulations, I can't talk apparently. Congratulations for being here at the last session of the day. Um, so please give us a congratulations for all of your, um, whoever gives you bonuses, so that you should get a special bonus for being at the last session on, on a long day of awesome presentations. Um, so I'm Jen Black, I'm from Boise State University. I'm Kim Carter Kranz, also from Boise State. We work as faculty associates with the eCampus program, so we both teach in the English department. We both teach both face-to-face -face and face-to-face uh, -face slash hybrid, because every every face-to-face -face class is now a hybrid that I teach, thanks to online teaching. Um, and we also teach online, and we teach some of the same classes. We work together closely, and we created this presentation for Northwest eLearning last year, and uh, we're asked to please come present it again. So hopefully it will be... Um, beneficial to you and it's a great chance for us to to share some of the things that we've learned and we've made some changes um, but anyway it's something we believe strongly in and something that if you had asked me 10 years ago like how do you create cheat proof tests on uh, black on your online classes I would have said such a thing is impossible but anyway I think hopefully they're I don't know if they're cheat proof but they are very much cheat preventative so we wanted to start out with just some quick introductions, kind of if you're on the instructional side or in the design side or administrative or kind of what you do, what you're working on. Are you, are you, are you teaching a class where you need to build an assessment or are you working with a faculty member and maybe they've come to you and said, I don't know how to assess this thing. Um, so kind of where are you coming from? Uh, my name is Jamie Rooney. Um, I'm from Central Oregon I'm actually the director of disability services. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm from the University of Oregon. I'm the ADP for online. Okay. Okay. 
I'm Lori Piccolo. I'm an instructional designer from Idaho State University. Oh, look at that. It's for many years now. Yay. I'm Maggie Stewart. I teach business at Lower Columbia College. So you're all instructional designer? Yeah. yeah. because she taught French. I noticed that yeah. you have extensive experience. Yep. Have one more person join us. Right. Introduce yourself. I'm uh, Jerry Lewis. I'm director of e-learning at Columbia Community College. Mm. And I sent you the wrong file name, so <laughs> that was not me. I'm the bad one. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, Probably the Dropbox. Yeah. yeah. My file name. <laughs> Maddie was totally like, did not pay attention to that. Send me, send me a, a I already did. Yeah. <laughs> so, like I mentioned at the beginning, so Kim and I teach a lot of similar courses. My field is Renaissance literature, so I teach a lot of Shakespeare, survey classes, introduction to literature, introduction to humanities, which is I what we will teach. Um, I, my specialty is 20th century literature, in particular 20th century French literature. So I teach a lot of philosophy, I teach language, I also teach some humanities courses, and some general lit courses in English. So. We thought we would start <laughs> by having you look at some test questions mm -hmm. and tell us, telling us how you would answer them. Mm -hmm. So not necessarily the answer that you would give, but what would you do to find the answer? Right, right. So. If you needed to find the answer. If you needed to find the answer, what's the first thing you would do? Which of the following artists is known for having painted the scene of the Sistine Chapel? Okay, fantastic. We can it. it. Okay, great. <laughs> right, exactly. You really should know this, but, yeah. but right. you just know. in case. <laughs> okay, so you can ask your friend. You could look on yeah. Wikipedia. Yeah. All right. What about this one? If you had to answer this, you need some dates. Google. 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 Copy that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly like it is. Yeah. Okay, copy it in. Yep. <laughs> oh, Siri. Alexa, exactly. Alexa. Alexa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Google, right? Google is everyone's friend. This is probably the first place that most people would turn. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Etc. I mean, you could literally put that, you know, phrase right in there, and this would be an easy one to find. 
you may be noticing some trends in these questions. Easy to look up. Easy to copy and paste that and some quotes. You take a line or two of that, throw it in Google, it's going to find it right away. All right, this is a little trickier, right? Translating something. Ah, Google Translate, all right. Google right. Translate, and um, there are apps on the phones, of course, that translate things for people. Yeah, we need, we need that. We do need this app. Um, there, and so there are lots of ways to do this. Um, what about that one. I mean, same thing. Okay, what about this, though? I mean, this is harder. Let's see if you can find what this is. I'm sure there is. There is an app for that. And I know what it is. Hopefully it's going to work. Oh, can't be oh, reached. Dang. Shoot. Well, you're not going to be able to find it then. Just Google something else. Well, I know what it is. In fact, I'll show you how I would find it. It's right here. And if I go like this. But if there's a piece of music played, let's say you're uh, listening to your radio in your car, and you're like, what is that song? What is that song? What's the first thing you do? Huh? You should Shazam. You can ask your phone. Yeah. You can ask Siri. Well, I try to remember some of the lyrics because I know you have yeah. Right. So you can Google a lyric. What if it's an yeah. orchestral piece? There are no lyrics, no, right? Shazam. Exactly. <laughs> Anybody's going to hold up their phone and have their Shazam app tell you exactly what okay. it is. Okay. Well, and when it finally opens. Oh, there. Now it's. Yeah. Fine. But notice that. Oh, now we get an ad. <laughs> Dang. All right. And it's so not, anyway, anyway, slow, all right, so, yes, I mean, there's, there's ways, even with a piece of orchestral music, I mean, notice that when I, I don't know if you noticed, but when I needed to find it, I could just pull from the URL, if the name was there in it, even if I, you know, try, and I've tried, so back in my, like, I'm going to stop them from cheating days, I would try changing the names of music files, and I would try, you know, doing all the things I could think of, and somehow, and my students, really well-meaning students, would say, oh, well, I just had to, you know, I, it was a hard, I couldn't see the name from the file you did, but when I opened it up, then the, the name showed up. I'm like, okay, well. What if the name looks yeah. piece right in it, right? All right, so we talked about Wikipedia, we talked about Google, we talked about Shazam, Siri, Alexa, talk to your friends. Just, yeah, ask your phone. Lifeline. So, of course, all the things that we know how to do, our students know how to do and more. Um, and so the premise behind our presentation is that instead of fighting against this, we should embrace the fact that students have access to a broad range of resources and design assessments that encourage them to make use of those resources to, um, to learn. Because in, the, in real life, they're going to have access to those resources. So st instead of fighting against it, find ways of, of taking advantage of it. I love this quote. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's so easy to get caught up in trying to catch students cheating or to give up trying to catch students cheating. So I've talked to faculty who have said, I know students are cheating, but it's just too much work to stop them. So... I'm just not going to worry about it, which I understand. That is exhausting, and to, be, to try to be the police, the surveillance state, um, is really difficult and impossible. And there are crazy, crazy methods for trying to keep people from cheating, right? Everything from the eye scans and the biometrics now to, oh, which is, I think we've got some of this yes. on here, right? To, you know, your camera has to be on so that the proctor who's sitting wherever the proctor is sitting can see you sitting there taking the test and not like you're doing this, you know, what? Really? I mean, come on. Well, for some students, not being able to go to the restroom, not being able to stand up and move actually introduces barriers to their ability to test accurately. For sure. And for other students, you need to have their phone to like measure their blood sugar or like, mm -hmm. like have a biomonitor of some kind on their phone. Having access to an electronic nearby is a matter of safety. Right. So like often the security measures that I've seen don't take it Actually, need to test accurately. Uh huh. Right. So. Yeah. Or you know, lock down, lock down, locking down the browser. You know, can't put on a window. You can't, you know, backtrack on the exam. You know, all the things. Right. There are a million and one things, and they're always going to be a step ahead of us. So given that. <laughs> so so this, we're not saying that there is no place for these things. Obviously, there are going to be situations in which these are needed for whatever reason. Um, but we we think that these should be the exception rather than the rule. So, so there's some advantages. Right? 
they can allow for multiple submissions. So I love using Turnitin or Safe Assign um, for my students to see what, what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. A lot of times they don't realize that they can't just copy and paste something from a website, even if they put the name of it somewhere in the sentence. Um, so for them to get a record, oh, that's not okay, especially when they're allowed to redo and resubmit. So they can say, oh, okay, I can see the things that I need to fix. Um, they can get, you can get fast reports from these things. Um, there's usually some technical help within them. Um, they are generally user friendly. Um, and so I don't know why we're actually, why we're giving you these advantages. <laughs> Disadvantages, they cost money for the university, often for the students, often it is the students who um, are already far away from campus, already trying to do a lot of things that have to pay these extra fees to have the browser locked down or to have the, the proctor you installed, that sort of thing. Um, there are ways of getting around them and our students know these, right? Oh, if I just switch the order of these two words, if I just change one letter in this word. So it's amazing to me sometimes how much work students will, will put in, it's how much effort they're gonna spend um, working around the cheating detection when we want them to be spending that time and, time and energy learning. It can't always tell the difference between correct citation and plagiarized material. And um, sometimes it's really difficult with schedules. And it's not always perfect. I mean, like any technology, there's always going to be problems. So I think one of the important things that we want to have you take away from this is that if we focus entirely on detection and catching people, at something, then we're not really able to focus on what it is that we want the students to do and learn from whatever the material is and the course is and the assessment is, right? Um, so what if we moved our focus from detection to creating a kind of academic community um, and new expectations for our assessments? What if we totally flipped the way we look at this and instead of trying to catch people doing something bad, we instead said, that's what you're going to do that's human, let's use that Googling that you're going to be doing in a way that is more constructive. So doing this allows us to focus more on teaching and less on catching our students doing something wrong. So if you really wish that you were a cop or a detective, maybe this feeds that part of you, but <laughs> there are better ways to do that, better ways to feed that. So why do students cheat? Um, lots of reasons. So I did a survey of 200 something instructors a, a few years ago and asked them to let me know what, why did their students cheat. And these are the reasons that instructors thought of. So they, some of them did think that students cheat out of laziness and that is possible. I, have, I, I asked some of my students a few weeks ago what is the biggest challenge that you're facing in college and a few of them did say, I'm much lazier than I thought I was. But not <laughs> most of them, not most of them. Um, confusion. Insecurity, pressure, lack of time, um, it's too easy to cheat. For in my experience at least, the vast majority of students that I had to call into my office because of academic integrity issues, um, they didn't feel confident in their own knowledge. They didn't feel secure that they had anything of value to add. They were afraid that they got down to the wire and they knew something was due. Um, and so very often when I have this conversation with them, um, I realize that it's, these are not cheaters. These are not students who are trying to game the system generally. Often there are pressures that are at work on them that make cheating the more uh, attractive option. And so we need to figure out ways to make cheating less attractive. And so the, that's what we're gonna try to focus on. So um, I don't know about the students at your universities. I imagine there's, we have a lot in common Many of our students are trying to work full time while they're going to school. They have families, they have parents that they're taking care of. Um, often they are taking too many classes and are in an attempt to get through more quickly. Sometimes they're not prepared for the classes that they come to. Sometimes they have a personal meltdown and they think, I'm just gonna copy this one assignment because if not, what's gonna happen to my grades? Um, one instructor said this, I think it often results from the high value our society and thus students places on grades in combination with tight schedules and competing demands. I think sometimes students see cheating as the only other option to getting a low grade for whatever reason and see cheating as the preferable option. 
right? And many things do ride on grades. And so, you know, there's a side conversation we could go into about how we are assessing, how grades are calculated in our class, and what message they send to students, but that's a different presentation for a different, different day. Um, so just a few more quotes about what the instructors said. Many high schools do not require students to cite sources for presentations. Few students know that reusing their own work for a different class without permission is considered academic dishonesty. So I have had students who, well, I guess I can think two students in my many years of teaching who handed in a paper from high school with their high school teacher's name and the date from high school on the paper. <laughs> so clearly these students were not really working hard to pull the wool over my eyes, right? I already wrote a paper on that. Great, I can turn that in. So that was partly a fault of the assignment that I created uh, and partly a fault of communication between me and the student. The wealth of information now instantly available by the internet seems to have blurred the line between intellectual material we can ethically call ours and what we cannot. If I found it on the internet, didn't I do the work? <laughs> right? I mean, I Googled that. I <laughs> researched through a bunch of websites to, to find that information. That was my effort. Um, and let me, well, let me oh, just interject right here real quickly back on this, this question of confusion. Um, there is also some cultural confusion that can happen. In some cultures, you are doing it properly if you've done the research and you're, you're quoting all of them. Literally, the entire paper is made up of quotations from other people. But that is appropriate in other cultures. It's not appropriate here. And that would be a legitimate point of confusion, right? So, and one that we may not be aware of. So just I'm going to just blast through a whole bunch of reasons here. Some, they're just liars, said one faculty member. Um, and they said rare, but still. Um, some don't, are, are just trying to get through. For some of them, college is a hoop that needs to be jumped through, and I'm going to jump through it. And maybe it's not the most ethical, ethical thing, but that's not why I'm here. I'm just here to get a degree and get out and get a job. Um, cultural. Cultural. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's a panic response. This is what I've seen the most, right? Just, I don't know what else to do. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to do this. Um, but sometimes, sometimes they don't ask because then they can say, I didn't know. Um, sometimes they don't know where to go help, to get help. They're not sure. And they think, well, I, I'll just do this. Maybe it will be okay. And so much times they have too much going on. So um, what we want to think about is ways that we can create a culture of academic integrity in our classes, things that we can do that are going to encourage students to focus on their learning and to um, know how to reach out when they have questions, but again, also to create assessments that encourage students to be very upfront about the resources that they're using and about how they're using them and why. So fundamentally, it's about creating a culture which focuses on membership and a learning community, being connected with academic honesty, and then also having critical conversations that reinforce that culture. And so if you approach as an instructor or even an instructional designer, if you approach a class with the idea of having a conversation amongst all of you and creating a culture of integrity. And by integrity, we don't mean cheat, no cheat. It's not a black, white kind of line um, with Googling being the cheating side and, and anything not on the Google side not being cheating, right? But having a conversation, larger conversation, about what actually is academic integrity and what is over a line that's somewhere in this invisible sand that we're talking about. So we'd like you on whatever you're writing on, paper on or some kind of device, to just write down your initial thoughts about how we as instructors, as administrators, as we're working within programs, how can we create a culture of integrity and then what kind of assessments encourage and reward that. So just, just take a few minutes to write down your thoughts about those or two talk questions. With whoever's next to you have to write it down. I'm a writing teacher, sorry. Talk. <laughs> Write down your thoughts. <laughs> what else is there to do? Talk. <laughs>
Now let's hear from a few of you about your answers to some of these questions. So first of all, in terms of creating a culture of integrity, what what kind of actions can we take to do that? What, do you, what How did you answer this first question? Yeah. I'm thinking about transparency, um, but primarily from the instructional perspective, I guess. Um, not necessarily from the student, but like just having the instructor be transparent about how they create assessments. So you know, all of this, everything that the instructor does, um, <coughs> I think that's a really good point. I think it goes to the relationship that the instructor develops with the students. Um, because if there's a sense of, of trust, and to, you, to use your word, transparency, mm -hmm. um, the student is more likely to come to you, I think, if they're under the gun and, and have a problem and, or don't understand an assignment or whatever it happens to be, all this list of things, right? Um, ran out of time because they had an emergency happen, whatever. Um, but if you have set that tone from the outset as the instructor, I think that they're more likely to come to you than they are to go the cheating route. And this has to do too with the language that instructors put in their syllabi and in their policies. So if the language around, instruct, about, around academic integrity says, don't cheat, cheaters will be prosecuted, <laughs> um, that sends a certain message, right? But if it says, you know, I take academic integrity seriously, um, th these are the things that for me count as cheating, which I won't allow. If you find yourself in a situation where this looks attractive to you, please come talk to me first and let's talk about what we can do to, to help you in that situation. Um, so, so many times, the thing I will usually tell my students is please don't sell your soul for my class. You know, you get to decide what you're going to sell your soul for, if anything, but it is not worth it for my class. So, um, so make, saying that up front, saying, I know you have pressures on you. And, I, and there might be a time when this looks like a good option. That is the time that you email me and say, hey, can we talk? Or I'm struggling on this assignment. So there are other, other choices. Yeah? Um, I think instructors can do a lot for modeling for students and for their colleagues. Like when they have lectures, you know, citing the images they got and how mm -hmm. the Creative Commons can let go, or, you know, at least kind of demonstrating how. Yeah, Absolutely. and it's not as overt, right? I mean, it's not, but modeling that behavior, they see that, and they see that the image has, has the alt tag, and they see that you've cited the whatever you've put in there, and you've got a list of references, and you've got all these things. And they're like, oh, well, that's the professional way to do it. And it's not like you're telling them this is what they have to do, but they see it. Yeah. So Kim and I just redesigned one of the classes that we teach over the summer, and one of the assignments we have students doing is... Um, doing research from multiple sites about specific artworks that they have chosen. And we decided to just put an example in, the first wiki that we did, an example of what we were looking for, where we cited the sources. And every student afterward looked at that model and said, oh, that's what we do. We cite sources. Look, the model does that. And that is, it has not been a problem for students just putting in information without at least indicating the sources that they, um, that they consulted for research. And so I think that, yeah, that goes a long way. I think uh, building a culture of integrity has to start with uh, a culture of belonging. Like everyone's voice is important, everyone's experience is important, and our institutions have not done a good job of fighting against the legacies that, that brought us to this point. Yes. And so starting with a culture of integrity where every student sees that their experience matters and that their voice is valid and that the administration is responsive to the truth that they bring. Um, I feel like you can't get to academic honesty if you don't also acknowledge the context in which it's taking place. Right. Mm -hmm. So that, that, I feel like that's also a deeper thing. Yes. Yeah. A lot of our institutions say that this is what we're doing, like that we're celebrating diversity or we're working against our histories of oppression, but it's not reflected in, in administrations or programs. Right. Um, so whether that's choosing choosing you know the material for your courses that represent marginalized voices or like actively soliciting more more information. I don't know how to partner with the girl. Right. Yeah. So 
one way I can think of that playing out on a course level is that there are times in our courses that we ask students to complete assignments that ask, that ask them to perform a sort of expertise that they don't have. Right, so a, a paper in which they are supposed to make a claim about a topic they may, might have just learned about um, and present some kind of idea that supposed to be new, right? New and groundbreaking in some way. And they just, they just learned about this thing, right? So of course they're not gonna have the confidence to say, I can boldly make this claim, but, but, they, but that's what we're asking them to perform. Instead of saying, hey, why don't you go do some research and share with us how did you research? What source did you go to? Why did you trust those sources? What did you learn that you didn't know before? Um, saying, hey, there's a wide world out there and you don't have to pretend like you're an expert on something that you're not an expert on yet. And of course, this depends on the level of the class. I teach a lot of undergraduates. Um, but even at the graduate level, this is, this is what we're trying to model, right? You, you make it clear when you are borrowing from sources. You make it clear how that has led you to the idea that you have. Other thoughts about either of these two questions? I was just going to add to that. So, I mean, just to sort of underscore on the design side, the importance of the scaffolding, right? I mean, you can't, like you said, you can't ask a student to perform up here if they're like, just start that down here. And on the design side, that's an important concept. A lot of you I know are working on that side. Yeah. And it's, it's tricky because we want to have high expectations for our students. But I've seen some online classes where all of a sudden, students have a major project thrown at them at the end of the semester that has not, that doesn't seem clearly related to anything they've done during the class. Lots of points writing on it. Um, has has you know expectations like I expect this to be your best work. Of the, I, I want you to wow me. So that's a lot. That's a lot of pressure, especially with no feedback before on you know how do I get to that point? Okay, so. Are there any other thoughts? Yes? One thing I was thinking about when we were looking at the questions early on was that they were very fact-based. Like, they were really lower order of thinking. For sure, right? yes. And they weren't, like, asking students to critically think, to synthesize, to, you know, do any of those right. sort of higher level things, which you can even do in the multiple choice test. It's just you have to write them. Yeah. Yeah, so, absolutely. Right. So, a way that encourages and rewards the culture, maybe this is kind of going towards the second one a little bit, is yeah. to change the way you're asking the questions instead of using lower order thinking skills, you know, recall and <laughs> memorize yeah. and all those things, you know, bump it up a little bit. Uh huh. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say that the scaffolding you're talking about also discourages cheating if you put things out as this is the topic of your paper and yes. you give feedback on that. So you're, you're, you know, what Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because then you would have had to buy the proposal and the, yeah. <laughs> and it and it makes it impossible to to procrastinate in that way. Or much harder to procrastinate. Right. right. Because the whole way along you're building all of the pieces that will eventually That's become right. the right. Right. So and another lens to use in thinking about this is the difference between formative and summative <coughs> assessment. So in thinking about and creating assessments. Um, sometimes, and this may seem obvious, but I don't think that instructors, instructors or instructional designers always do this. Think about what you really want students to know. Which facts are essential for them to memorize and which could they look up when needed? Um, so doctors even now today sometimes will look something up to be sure that they're giving the correct diagnosis. So certainly we want them to have foundational knowledge, but I'm glad that my doctor has access to databases and internet and, and that sort of thing. I mean, she's not Googling things, but she has access to other resources that go beyond what she has in her head. Those used to be in books on her shelf. Now she has them in an electronic database. Um, so if I know that they can look this up, I don't probably want to spend my time testing them on that unless I have a really good reason, which I'm going to explain to them. Mm -hmm. Right. So for instance, if I make my students memorize names and dates of something, then I want to tell them the reason that you're going to need to have these things memorized is because that's going to, and, you know, whatever, I don't know, have a good reason for that because I don't usually ask them for that. <laughs> um, which concepts and frameworks do they need to internalize? Are there things that they need to practice doing multiple times 
and to the point that it becomes um, second nature to them? And if so, then that might be, this is why I'm gonna test you on this over and over because I want it to become instinctive for you. So I know you could look this up, but you're gonna need it, this from something coming up. What skills will they need to have developed to work effectively? So where, what, what's building on this class? How are they gonna use this in the future? And how does the knowledge that I'm asking them to gain connect to um, applicable skills? We have some more questions for you. So in, in the class that you are teaching or a class that you are helping someone on, we'd like you to think about these three questions. So what, what are the goals of the assessments in this class? What are you trying to do with the assessments? You can start by saying assess, but assess what specifically? What do you want students to learn from the assessments they are completing? And how will they be applying the things that they are assessed on? So just think of a specific class that you're working on. Take a couple of minutes just to write down your thoughts. So what are the goals? What, what should the experience of the assessment be like? And what are they gonna do with the things, the knowledge or skills that are being assessed? We need more time. I, I want to actually talk a little bit about the first one because I, I, when I was thinking about this question, when it just popped up on the slide, I, I was it was reminded of colleagues that I've had in the past who it seemed like their only goal was to sort of trick people up. <laughs> you know these people, right? Um, they write this question on a test that's like some stupid thing. <laughs> is trying to get the most odd example of whatever it is that there could be that was the footnote to the footnote, you know, in the whatever. I mean, and we've probably all known those people. And that was their goal somehow, was to like, stick it to them. <laughs> Why? <laughs> but what did you put for your answers? Anyone? What, why do we assess? Why do we create assessments? Okay. That's a good reason. We are very good students. Yes. Some programs are really focused on gatekeeping because of the you know credentials of the program or the accreditation of the program, the reputation of the program. So their assessments are intended to weed out students who don't rise to the top, or that at least that's what I think the idea is. Right. Um, and so I, I think assessment is used um, like weaponized in some way yes. rather than used as a tool for formative growth or learning or showing students. And a positive spin on that could be that assessments are trying to make sure that students are prepared for what comes next. Yes, I like right? that. So if I am if I'm planning to become a chemistry major and I can't pass the assessments in Chem 111, um, first of all, I maybe want to change my major. But second, I, I'm going to need to spend more time there because I, I'm going to need that to go on. And so again, though, I'm not sure that our students understand that. Um, and if they did understand it, then maybe they'd be a lot less likely to cheat because they say, oh, I can see if I don't do well here, I'm going to be really in trouble coming forward. Yeah? One course I've been working with is a graduate course in epidemiology, and their assessments in the past have been a little bit, you know, multiple choice questions, and 
and in conversations with the faculty person, what do you want? What's the end goal here? Like the, your question, and, and she's like, well, I want these people when they become public health professionals in the next two years, to be able to like, like apply epidemiological frameworks and calculations to make public health policies that you know <laughs> make sense. And I was like, there you go. That's there what your assessment should be. Right? Yeah. So you should be doing that. <laughs> you know? So you ask your students to apply, right? Yep. And you ask them to do it in a project that actually sees it through, right, from the data to the implementation instead of here's your multiple choice. Did you do the reading kind of test? Yeah. 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 And, and actually, that's what I was thinking about this. So in a class that I teach, I have multiple choice quizzes. They are not timed. Students can take them twice. They're open book. And sometimes students will come to me and say, you know, I use control F to find the answer. And I said, you read the answer. I wanted you to read that in the text. I'm so glad that you found it. Right? So my goal with that quiz was to make sure that you read those words. And you did, and guess what? They, you remember those because you had a quiz question. And often I'll ask them. And you were afraid you cheated, so you remember yeah. it. <laughs> right. right. You thought you were being smart, but I knew, I mean, I'm fine with you doing that because my whole goal is that I want, I, the, I wrote the quiz questions to direct your attention to the things that I wanted to be sure that you read. The things that I was sure, and so I'll write the quiz questions often to make sure that you read that whole paragraph. So if my goal is to get students to get those main ideas, then I'm going to write a quiz that is going to help them to get those main ideas. And I'm going to let them do it a couple of times with new questions randomized so that by the time, and I ask my students, what do you remember from the reading? And nine times out of 10, it's the things I ask them questions on. So that's my goal, great. And super low stakes quiz, right? Like this isn't, you know, 90% of the class grade. This is 5% or 10% yeah, of the class grade, right? Super low stakes, just to direct their reading as much as anything else. Yeah. Other thoughts about the, the goals of assessment? The reasons that we do this? One reason I like, I, I like formative assessment is helping students know how much they know. Um, or, or like realize like, oh, I, I do have a grasp of this, or oh, I do have an understanding of how this is developing. Because it shows, it shows students the, the fruit of their work. Absolutely. Especially when it's low stakes. Yes. <laughs> right, which is a helpful yeah. tool. Yeah. But to know that that's okay. To know that it's okay. It's yeah. okay because that's where we're pointing you. And there's a reason for that. Yeah. And I think that goes back to that transparency, letting students know, this is why I have this test set up in the way that I do. Mm -hmm. This is an open book test for a reason. I know that this is a difficult reading. And so I'm hoping that the quiz will be a tool for you to make sense of what you've just read so that you're prepared for the discussion that's coming. All right, so um, some examples. One of them is from a class that Kim and I teach, and, and these are, we've bolded some of, the, um, some of the learning outcomes for the course. So this is a cultural history class. It's, it's kind of a fire hose class, lots and lots of information. Two of the things that they have to do is identify or analyze major works of visual art, music, philosophy, literature, and or architecture, and explain how specific works in multiple humanities disciplines reflect the culture and our time period that produce them. So the, the test for this class used to be that students in a face-to-face -face class would have the Mona Lisa put up on a slide and they would have to say, that is the Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci, and it's important because it's a half-length portrait, and you could uh, go, I'm sure, beyond on this, but um, it was much more memory recall, right? What has my instructor said to me that I could write back down? Um, that doesn't work so well when you have Wikipedia, right? And when you go and Google, okay, this is important because, and I'll use words that I don't know because I, that's what the website used. So we had to think about what might we do that would take advantage of the online environment for assessing some of these outcomes. So we came up with some questions that would ask students to apply their knowledge in a different way. We gave them this piece, and we said, place this selection historically using details and comparisons to support your decision. What do you notice about this image that might help you identify which culture and period it comes from? So this asks the students to open the book, to look at the chapter, to look at the other uh, pieces of art that are in this particular chapter, to make comparisons, to notice details. 
We know they're gonna open the book. I don't even care if they do a Google image search and they tell me what this is. That doesn't tell me details and comparisons to support their decision. If they tell me the time and the name of a piece, that doesn't answer the question and that doesn't cut it, right? So Googling it, fine, whatever. Google to your heart's content. It doesn't answer the question because we want them to notice details. We want them to, you know, make comparisons. We want them to um, support, you know, their reason, their, their choice, their explanations. Um, and so we rework the questions, this is an example, um, to take advantage of the fact that we know they're going to Google. We know they're going to Shazam. We know they're going to whatever. So along with that, we, we give them some sample questions. We say, this is how we would tackle a question like this. So what clues might you pull from this? Well, notice that it's carved of stone, like the colossal head from the Olmec culture in our textbook. Notice that it has a terrifying face on it, like the figures in the Madrid Codex in our textbook. So these are all, this is all modeled. This is how I would, we would approach this. What, might, what things might I notice about this? And how do they relate to things that are in the reading that we had to do for class? And so all these clues point to this piece coming from Central America, probably from the Aztec culture, because it is similar to these other works that we've studied in class. So I want your textbook open. I want Google open, because I want you to use your skills to say, I've learned how to pay attention to some things. And pay attention to detail and compare, as opposed to memorize and regurgitate. And so then we ask them to make comparisons to some of those works, and then we give them an example of what a work, an, an answer might look like. I think this work comes from Central South America, probably the Aztec culture for several reasons. First, it's carved out of stone, like the colossal head from the Olmec culture in our textbook. It's similar in style to the goddess in our text because of the many hands. So we say, you know, we want you pulling these things together and then using your own judgment. And some of the sample answers we give them are wrong. Uh, deliberately, we say, notice this student didn't place the selection correctly, but they had a lot of good reasons for the decision that they made. And cultural historians don't always even agree about some of these things. So what we are more interested in is that you are using what you have to draw reasonable conclusions. And you know, if you're way off base and don't have any evidence, that's not okay. But if you have some good reasons for what you chose, then we can give you some points for that. This is not a yes, no, right, wrong answer. Mm -hmm. This is a, a, we're trying to teach you how to use the knowledge you have to draw these conclusions. I love what you just said about cultural historians disagree. <laughs> Right. I mean, if someone put that piece yeah. in, you know, ancient Greece, we would have a conversation. But you know, right. yeah. Right. Well, this is assignment seems like so much more fun too. I mean, yeah. It's like solving a mystery. Yeah. Exactly. Just like oh, I memorized these facts about this. Which is totally <laughs> boring, and who cares? Yeah. <laughs> it is, and who cares? Right. Right. And, it, and it is interesting to see students thinking, and especially. What, what we started doing was have students doing, pra doing practices of these questions in each unit in preparation for a midterm and preparation for a final, where they could say, okay, I'm gonna take a stab at this, and then they'd give it to us and I'd say, okay, I can see what you're doing here, but did you think about this, did you think about this? And we also set it up so that once they submitted their practice answer, then they would see practice answer that we wrote to the same question, so they could compare, oh, okay, I didn't think to notice that. Because if our goal is to get them to pay attention to things, to listen carefully, to read carefully, then we want to give them lots of practice in doing that. So we've, we have a few other examples from a couple of other kinds of classes. They're very different, but they, they share some of the same characteristics. So here is an example of a, of a mathematics question. How long would it take you to count to one billion reciting the numbers one after another? First, write a guess in your notebook, then come up with a thoughtful answer. One approach is to actually do it and have someone time you, but there are other manageable alternatives. <laughs> what assumptions did you make in your calculation? Okay, so what do you notice about this question? There's multiple ways to get the answer. Yeah. Exactly. Multiple ways to get the answer. What else? It's so much longer than the questions that we had at the beginning. It's like one word answers and this date. Yeah. The question itself requires you to slow down. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. So 
So a lot of my students, uh, I teach a class about learning theory and about college level thinking, and a lot of my students say, math can't be taught in a way that requires critical thinking. Because their experience of math has been plug into the algorithm. And so to look at a question like this, or sometimes I'll ask them a question, I'll say, okay, you know, um, I'm gonna tell you a math question. When you have it solved, I want you to just put your hand up to your chest. This is basically this class, by the way. Put your hand up to your chest, and, um, and then, so I say 18 times five. And as soon as you have an answer, put your hand up to your chest. And so they do, and then I say, okay, so what's the answer, call it out? And then they usually call out the right answer. And then I say, okay, let's talk about how you solved it. Let's, all, let's write all your methods on the board for how you solved it. And they say, oh, that's, I've never done math like that. It's always been about getting the right answer and not so much about, and I'm not a math teacher. So that was just an example about, you know, how do we, if, if what we are valuing is their ability to solve problems, yes, we want them to learn the content, but we want them to learn it in such a way that they can apply it in a variety of situations. So a couple more math. So, yeah. You can actually can you? Oh, okay. So can you Google your guess and but your yeah, thoughtful so answer? The test makes very sense. Okay. That's, you know, I mean, you could even say, don't Google this. I want your, your, your opinion. Right. You know, and right, they would have first have to write do their guess, and then they would have to come up with the. Or you could say, I have Google it. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I know. I know what the Google answer looks like. But, but the assumptions. Answer, Yeah. Like that's what they're Google. Yeah. Well, and, and, and like Jen is saying, if if the the answer, the goal is to get to the right answer, but there are multiple ways to get there, then why not teach them all the ways to get there? And I think the way it's written, too, I don't think it would be the first response to Google it. And I think that's very important you know, because it's, it's much more engaging. Yeah, but it's, it's not thinking immediately. And I think, I think that you might even say, it's okay with me if you Google this, but I still want your answers to the other questions. Sure. So, right, because it's not so much the answer that we talk about, it's all the other things. Well, and then it specifies a thoughtful answer. Yeah, right. 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 Like taking the thought right. and response to it. Right. So pick a number, add five, and multiply the result by four. Add another five and multiply the result, multiply the result by four again. Subtract 100 from your result and divide your answer by eight. How does your answer compare to the original number? And then you're supposed to do this a few times until you see a pattern. I did not make these up, by the way. These came from my friend who teaches math teachers how to teach math. And so these are sort of some of the examples that she uses to try to help them break out of their old ways of assessment. Uh, we won't do that one. Another, another example comes from an anthropology class, and this one's very different as well. So this is what the instructor tells the students. Um, here, attached or linked, are the 25 multiple choice questions that will be on next week's exam. Determine the correct answer to each of the 25 questions. Be able to write an essay explaining why the answer you chose is right. Be able to, you don't have to write it yet. Or the other answer is wrong, you're welcome to study in groups or alone. It's great to study in groups to talk to your assignment. And then the exam is this. When the timed exam opens next week, and they tell them this all from the beginning, the 25 multiple choice questions will be in scrambled order from the study exam. Together with the course TAs, I've chosen four of the 25 as essay questions. Of the four possible questions, you must choose three. You're required to write essays for each of the three questions, explaining and defending the answer you chose as correct. I love this. I think this is a great, so what do you notice about this? of things and you're not gonna have to write a whole bunch of essays but you need to be ready right so I don't just care about you getting the right answer I care about you understanding or being able to at least explain why the answer you chose is correct or why you, what led you to believe that answer and why the others are incorrect right, right. all right go ahead Yeah. 
Exactly. Yeah. It, it doesn't just feel like a professor trying to trick you or, you know, actually it's like for... Exactly. And I, and I think that often just adding some kind of reflection to any kind of assessment, any, you know, if any, especially in an online format where students have a little more time sometimes, but, you know, a, after whatever assessment, just a little reflection about, you know, how did you come to your answers? Or what process did you go through to prepare for this exam? Was it effective? Or which of these questions is the best um, evidence of what you've learned in this part of the course? Which one of those, did, which, some, which ones of them did you feel like didn't actually show what you learned? I've started adding a question like that on every major assessment in my in some of my classes, and often the students will be really honest with me about, you know, this one I felt like this didn't have a whole lot to do with what I had learned, or this one was really helpful for me because it helped me put these pieces together. And so that's good for me to know too, because I say, okay, I scrapped that other one, put something else in its place. But it also gives them a chance to say, oh, what, what I did was valuable, not just what I arrived at. <laughs> yeah. One thing that I might suggest and I'm starting to think about and then it, as a parallel or as an alternative to actually writing essays is allowing a student to sit with a TA and describe their answers out loud um, so that you're really moving toward multiple ways of showing your knowledge. Right. Or like prepare a short video response or whatever. Yeah. Just sure. so that students who might have barriers with writing don't feel like they're being assessed on their writing alone. Yeah. Um, Question of bias, and I'm going to tell you why. Right. I love that, and it also respects the test taker, you know, mm -hmm. and like their experience of kind of moving that through. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's very helpful. Something else that's kind of tangential is I was talking to a faculty member a few weeks ago who looks at the analytics for an exam, and any question that more than 50% of the students miss, he throws out because yeah. he says that's clearly my fault. Yeah. Right. If that many students are missing the question. And I did not teach that very well, which I thought was a great practice, right? To say, all right, so it's, I, I must not have written a good question rather than, oh, these students, why can't they know this, this topic? So paying attention to the, the correlation between how are we preparing them. And maybe you know using exam wrappers, so there's online ways of using exam wrappers as well, right? When you give students back their exam and you say, how did you study for this exam? How did you think that you did on the exam? And how does that compare to how you actually did? And what can we learn from that together that might help us prepare for the next exam? Mm -hmm. So um, our thought that you don't have to do that right now, but you could do moving on, is to think about a class you're working on. Think about the objectives. Think about the assessments that are So a class you're, you're teaching yourself or that you're helping someone prepare. What assessments you currently use to measure that objective? And keeping in mind the things that we've talked about, right? How does this assessment help to build a culture of academic integrity? How does it take advantage of the resources that students might have access to? And especially if you can tell them, hey, there are these resources out there. And sometimes if you say, how did you come to your answer? And students said, I use this website. I'll put this on the, that on the list for next time so that other students know, oh, this is out there that I can use. Which promotes honesty, right? I mean. If you have that kind of reaction from your instructor, if you say, I went to this website, and if that's the reaction of the instructor, the student's going to be honest the next time when you ask that question. They're not going to try to hide. They're not going to be like, well, I just knew. I just knew it. But I think that, that for them to know that, that you know about these resources, and so for instance, my, when I teach Shakespeare, I will often ask my students, what resources did you use to help you understand the reading for this section of